All right. Well, I'm, I'm Director of Informatics and Biocomputing at Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. Uh, and I'm one of the PIs on the Reactome project, which is a knowledge base of human pathways. And I'll be appropriately enough lecturing on the use of pathway databases to help in cancer genome analysis. Okay, so here are the, the usual obligate copy, anti-copyright statements. Uh, so what we were talking about, uh, what you've heard about this morning are uh, use of, of uh, over-representation analysis and uh, uh, I'll just put them up, uh, various ways of taking lists of genes and using their functional relationships to uh, infer the mechanism, the meaning of a gene list. And so uh, you've, you've heard about uh, David this morning, I believe, and uh, that is a class of algorithms called over-representation analysis, where you look at a set of gene uh, genes that have been sorted, bags of genes that have been sorted out by their um, uh, by uh, their functional annotation, uh, what, what do they do, and you look for biases in the representation among those bags of genes within a cancer gene set. Um, another uh, related, uh, related class of gene set analysis is called functional class scoring, uh, where uh, it, it is basically the same thing. The, the, the genome has been partitioned into a set of genes, each of which uh, uh, corresponds to a different functional annotation set. Uh, and then you use a, a ranking statistic to, uh, to look for um, uh, unexpected patterns in the representation of your cancer genes among those bags. The last type, and what we're going to talk about here, um, is a pathway topology measures. Both of, uh, both of these, um, these types of uh, pathway analysis um, are, are strict partitions of genes into one bag or, or another. This gene participates in DNA repair or it participates in, uh, in cell cycle regulation it's not allowed to do both. You have to make a choice about what the gene does. Uh, for, and furthermore, once a gene is in the bag, all the relationships among the DNA repair genes is basically lost. We know that one is a, 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 an inhibitor, another is a, um, uh, is a cofactor, another one participates in um, uh, creating a, a multimer which binds to chromatin to turn on a gene. All that information is lost um, in these partition-based uh, uh, classification systems. Uh, we don't want to throw that information away. It's very useful. And so, the la so what we'll be talking about now are techniques for analyzing the, relate the, the me mechanisms that connect a, uh, a set of genes that are altered in cancer um, via the, the prism of the pathway and the relationship among the genes in that pathway, so that you get f mechanistic information out. Okay, and so the and the tools that I'll talk about are the Reactome Functional Interaction Network, and some um, uh, paradigm a, a very very new system that is coming online now. So, so gene set enrichment analysis has limitations. Uh, one of them is that uh, there are diff many different ways of slicing and dicing. Uh, the genome. You can do it by disease, or you can do it by molecular function, or biological process. Um, and it's not always obvious which is the right dimension at which to, to create your gene sets. Uh, second, uh, the gene, uh, when you do get a set of enriched gene sets, you frequently get uh, a lot of uh, overlapping things which seem to be related, but you're not quite sure how. So, for example, you might have uh, keg telling you a, a, a pathway based set based on keg telling you that these are genes involved in um, uh, in chromatin maintenance that's one set is enriched in chromatin ma uh, maintenance another set related to um, pancreatic cancer is enriched is this is, does this have something to do with each other or are these independent sets you don't know without sorting through them and then, uh, as I said before, the, the bags of genes uh, obscures the fact that there are actually complicated relationships among the genes in those bags. 
So pathway databases um, are um, a, the first step in disentangling this and understanding the relationship among affected genes in a cancer genome set. Uh, the, the advantage of pathway databases are usually they're highly curated, highly accurate um, uh, knowledge bases that are derived from experiment, the experimental literature. They use a biochemical view of, the bio, of biological processes, similar to what we learned in freshman biochemistry. They capture cause and effect and mechanism, and they can give you human interpretable visualizations, usually as a Leninger-style pathway diagram. Disadvantage of them is, of pathway databases is that because they're curated, uh, it, it's uh, very labor intensive to create these databases. They don't cover the whole genome. They typically cover only a little corner of the genome. And uh, also because it's a human manual process uh, and, and people can, uh, people can, uh, can uh, disagree on where the subjective boundaries of pathways uh, fall, different pathway databases will disagree on the boundaries of pathways. So one, uh, one database may put DNA, DNA repair and cell cycle checkpoints into one big pathway because they're highly related, another may split them up. The, the pathway database that most of you are probably familiar with is KEG. How many people have not heard of KEG? Okay. That's great. Uh, so Keg, Keg is the Kyoto Encyclopedia of Genes and Genomes and is a curated database of, um, of intermediary metabolism in human and uh, uh, several hundred other organisms. Uh, many of them are, many of them are prokaryotes. They also have sections that uh, deal with higher processes such as uh, cell cycle regulation, signaling, and so on, things which are usually more uh, applicable to cancer. The core of KEG are these diagrams which show, I don't know how well this is projecting, it looks fuzzy to me, even up here, but these are all small molecules, these are all sugars of various sorts, and it's showing the enzymatic steps which, which um, transform the sugars in, uh, in, a, uh, in, uh, a, uh, in sugar, sugar metabolism, I think. Down here, it's creating some amino acids, but I, I actually can't read this very well myself. Um, Reactome, the database that um, uh, uh, I work on with, with Robin Hall, who will be your lab instructors this, this afternoon, um, is similar in many respects to uh, KEG, but it focuses ex almost exclusively on human pathways. And so we provide uh, a lot of coverage of higher order regulatory processes. So here we're looking at um, uh, a, uh, um, the uh, NCAM1 signal transduction step here, and it's showing some details uh, in which the NCAM1 receptor is uh, forming a, uh, a dimer in response to a ligand binding event, and then it shows the downstream sig uh, signaling events. Uh, and uh, because it is a curated database, you see the, uh, a, a hand-drawn diagram here. You see a bit of text that's been written by a, um, a PhD level uh, curator or in, in fact a principal investigator, guest author, it has citations and down here there's, there's much more information about uh, each of the steps that you're seeing. Okay. So Reactome is hand curated. Um, it, every, re every reaction, every molecule is traceable to some reference in the primary literature. Um, it's primarily human, but it does, we do project our pathways onto non-human species just for the sake of completeness, and we just use orthology information to make our best guess of what the pathway looks like in other species. And we have a series of, uh, we have a Google Map style reaction diagram that you can overlay information on. We'll, I'll be showing you this. Um, you can find pathways containing your gene lists, you can calculate overrepresentation of your gene set and pathways, and you can find, a, if you have a pathway in human, you can find the related genes and pathways in other species. Uh, a big thing that is, distinguishes it from KEG is that Reactome is open access, and KEG is a is a, has a, uses a license model. And so, um, so uh, with this, um, um, 
you know, the, the main thing that you can do is take your gene set, upload it into Reactome, or in fact many, many of the pathway databases will do something similar, and it will then show you a series of diagrams in which the genes that you have uploaded are highlighted in their diagrams, and then you can see if they're clustering in a way that looks suspicious to you, and if so, uh, try to make hypotheses about what the effect of the mutations or changes in expression you're seeing are. Now, I said that a major problem with pathway um, databases is that they're subjective. There are several of them, uh, and they all disagree on where they, what the pathways are and, and how they overlap. Uh, that's being addressed by this resource at Sloan Kettering called the Pathway Commons, in which um, uh, about uh, uh, nine different databases um, including including uh, Reactome uh, and at one point including Keg, um, but it may no longer be in here. Do you do you know if Keg is now part of Pathway Commons now, or is it it's been removed? Yeah, it's been removed. Yeah. Um, uh, the, each of the each of these Pathway databases has agreed to um, export its data in a common format called BioPacks, and then those pathways are imported into the Pathway Commons, into one big database that's a union of them all. And now you can do things like search for a pathway or search for a molecule, and it will bring back uh, everybody's pathway that has that molecule in it or is related to that, related to that pathway. So it's a, nice, it's a nice resource when you feel that you're not getting the full picture to get, to get uh, everybody's view in, a, uh, uh, in, a, in one convenience uh, spot. So here is the major thing that one does with um, with pathway databases. It's very it's a very primitive operation, but it's a, it can be effective. It's just pathway colorization. You upload a gene list. Database calculates an enrichment score in each of the pathways using GSEA or overrepresentation analysis, and displays a ranked list of those pathways. And then you click on those pathways, and it gives you a colorized picture of that pathway diagram with the genes that you uploaded highlighted. And then you can download it as a picture and put it into a, a publication, if you would like. Here's an example from Reactome. We have um, uh, selected in our file browser a list of genes which are mutated in glioblastoma multiforme. Upload it. It's giving us a list of overrepresented pathways, the one that's at the top is signaling by platelet-derived growth factor. It has a p-value of 3 times 10 to the minus 11. Um, and it lists all the genes in your list, which are contained in that pathway. And as we go down, there are increasingly lower p-values lower p -values, uh, for enrichment in, a, in signaling by near the growth factor, and hemostasis, insulin receptor, and so on. Uh, and then if you browse into that pathway, you get the diagram. Again, I'm sorry, this is not very, uh, this is um, uh, looking out of focus. And it shows you the PDGF pathway with the, uh, um, uh, with the genes that you um, uh, uploaded, highlighted, and it's using a, uh, a colorization score to show you the uh, statistical significance of that hit. Uh, black things in this particular, in this representation are, um, correspond to multimers, complexes, in which one, one member of the complex contained your gene and the other did, and, uh, others, uh, others did not. And if you mouse over this, it shows you a little view of all the, uh, of all the components in that, uh, in that complex. Okay. Okay, so that's that's colorization and uh, Robin, is there going to be an example of that? Are we doing that? Are they doing that this afternoon? No, you're just doing the the network stuff. Okay, relatively straight, relatively straightforward. However, I'm going to spend the rest of the time talking about net, network and network analysis. So the problem with the pathway databases uh, is that they really only capture the well understood portion of 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 biology. Um, and there's nothing that you can't get out of the pathway database that you couldn't get out of, out of assiduous literature searching. And in fact, the pathway database may just be a way of getting an ent entry into the, into the literature. Uh, in order to get at the, um, uh, at the, the 
novel portion of, of biology, you have to look beyond what's co covered in the current literature and go to the high, thru high throughput experiments. Um, and here we're talking about relationships among genes which, um, uh, which are hypothetical, which, um, uh, um, and, and which are suggested by uh, high throughput experiments, but we don't ex ex understand the exact relationship among them. And they can be things like genetic interactions. You have a uh, epistasis in, uh, uh, in uh, yeast, or you have uh, genes which are um, uh, uh, co-regulated in, co -regulated in humans, so among a series of expression arrays, whenever one is up, the other one is always up or, uh, or always down. Physical interactions, if you do a, um, a, uh, a mass spec on uh, uh, a immunoprecipitation, you find that the genes, uh, the protein products are associated with each other, but you don't know exactly how they're associated with each other. Um, or um, they, they share uh, go terms, or they're close together in pathways. These are things where we, we think that the genes are interacting with each other, they're related to each other, but we don't know exactly exactly how. And there's, if, if, if you look at this, this level of information, there is, um, uh, you, can, you can reach out and touch uh, genes which are, which are not well annotated in the literature, um, but which probably have something to do with the, the biological process you're looking at. So I'm going to talk about a variety of networks. I'm going to um, in, first introduce the, uh, uh, some terminology for you first. So uh, um, biological networks consist of a series of, uh, of vertexes, also called nodes, and edges, which uh, connect one node to another. So typically, when we're talking uh, biological networks, the nodes are proteins, or their genes, or their RNAs, and the, uh, the edges might be physical interactions between them, or might be regulatory relationships between them, or might be something more abstract than this, such as uh, co uh, frequency of co-mention in, a, in, in uh, PubMed abstracts. Okay. Uh, so uh, a cycle is a, a loop uh, among, among two or more, uh, or, or three or more uh, nodes. Uh, and there are two types of edges that we'll talk about. There are undirected edges. So these are things which don't have <coughs> directionality, such as uh, frequency of, uh, of um, co-mention in the same paper or a physical interaction, uh, whereas directed edges are, imply a, um, a, a, a directed relationship between one protein or another, such as this protein is an enzyme that cleaves that protein. Or this is a regulator which upregulates that gene. So there are many ways of, a network is a very, um, a very uh, uh, facile, uh, facile uh, data model. You can represent many different things using a network. Uh, simple way of mapping biology to network is our protein-protein interactions, where you have each node is a protein and each edge is an interaction between them. But edges can be other relationships, such as uh, you know, a kinase activating a target or a epistatic reaction, uh, epistatic relationship in a, in a genetic study, or similarities, such as protein sequence similarity. And when it, it's critical to understand uh, what the network is representing before you start working with it for obvious reasons. So here's an example of a, uh, an, an, uh, a, an early network from about 10 years ago. These are uh, a, a series of protein complexes that were pulled down from uh, baker's yeast and analyzed by mass spec. Um, each node is a protein that was identified by mass spec, and each edge indicates that they co that, that those two proteins co-precipitated with each other. They were in this they were complexed with each other in some way. 
So that's a protein interaction network. This is a, um, um, uh, a very pretty representation of the uh, protein sequence similarity network among uh, uh, a, a large number of organisms. And this is representing the, the uh, gene families, the phylogenetic tree. Okay, very, in, in many ways, are very similar looking, um, but they, they, they mean quite different things. Okay, so here are some more network concepts that I'll be referring to. So each node in a network has uh, between, uh, has at least one edge connecting it, uh, and some have one edge, some have, will have two edges, some will have three edges, some will have uh, more, you can have hundreds of uh, edges coming out of a node. The count of the number of edges that's going into or coming out of a node is called its degree. Higher degree, the more edges it has. The shortest path is a property of two nodes, and it, it indicates how many hops it takes to get from, one, from node A to node B. In this case, the path length is two. That's the shortest way to get there. You could also take a more roundabout route. Here would be one that, that is involves uh, one, two, three hops, um, but the, uh, typically we measure the shortest, the shortest path, and it gives us a, a idea of the, uh, the degree of connectedness in, in the network. And finally, uh, there's the concept of betweenedness. Um, for every node, there are some number of shortest paths that go through that node. Uh, and uh, the number of shortest path, paths indicates um, how, how, how popular that node is. So there are some nodes here which are kind of out, out on the fringes. They're the social outcasts of the network world. Others who have a few, have a few relationships, but then there, uh, uh, that then there, is, uh, there is this one wildly popular node which not only has a lot of um, uh, has a lot of uh, uh, edges coming out of it. It has degree four, but it also is, is kind of in the middle of the network. It's central to the network, and so most of the shortest paths between uh, all b between uh, any any arbitrary set of pairs go through this one. Okay. Now the the key of this is that these central nodes are actually. Uh, ones which are holding the network together. And if you look at, if you map this to a biological regulatory network, these tend to be thing, uh, kind of master regulators, things like P53 that everybody talks to. And uh, there is a, uh, a tendency of these ones to be uh, more likely to be involved in, in diseases than the uh, genes which are on the, on the uh, outside of the network. Okay. The last concept before we actually get into the meat of it is uh, scale, is the scale-free properties of the biological network. So what, you, you can construct networks in various ways, and this one of the simplest ways of doing it is you take a bunch of, uh, of nodes and you randomly generate a set of, uh, of edges. So you would pick all pairs and sometimes you make an edge between them and sometimes you don't. You just do it randomly and you'll end up with something like this. And uh, if you were to graph the relationship between the degree of, uh, of any node, so the degree is k, and the, uh, the number of times nodes of that degree occur, you get, uh, uh, you, you get a bell curve like this, where, um, where there are most of the nodes have a certain k, it depends on how many times you ran the, ra ran the randomization, and then it tails off in either direction. Okay. Another, type of, um, another type of network is called a scale-free network. And in, um, in, in this type of network, um, there is a uh, very different distribution of, of, deg of degree. The vast majority of nodes have a low degree, low degree of one. Uh, ones that have degree two, like this one here or that one there, are some factor, some fold, uh, less frequent than the ones above it. And as you increase the, no the, the amount of the number of, uh, 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 as you increase the degree, 
the number of nodes with that having that degree drops off exponentially. So nodes of degree two are tenfold less likely than nodes of degree one. Nodes of degree three are tenfold less likely than nodes of degree two. If you graph that out on a, a log scale, in this case, you would, because it's exponential, see an exponential, linear exponential drop off of the, uh, um, uh, of the probability of a node by increasing degree. Okay? Uh, then finally, you have hierarchical network hierarchical networks uh, where uh, um, again it has a uh, it has the same it has the same rule um, of uh, same distribution of a degree by uh, the probability of a uh, node having a particular degree it drops off exponentially. But there's, there's considerable structure. So there is, in fact, only one node of high degree, and then there are 10 times that many nodes of lower degree, and it has this very well-defined structure. Um, the, when people started, uh, started uh, looking at biological networks, there was a lot of disagreement about what, kind of bi what, what the network properties of biological networks are. Turns out that they're scale-free. They follow this. Uh, exponentially decreasing, um, uh, uh, exponentially de de decreasing law. Um, to distinguish it from a hierarchical network, you can look at the uh, the relationship of the clustering coefficient, uh, which is a measure of the size of, of neighborhoods. And in a scale-free network, uh, as the degree increases, the the, the, the size of the neighborhood actually remains constant. The clustering coefficient remains constant. In a hierarchical network, it drops off. And so uh, basically every, every biological network that's been looking, looked at, including gene networks, but including other things such as um, uh, you know, branching of bronchioles in the, uh, in the lung, uh, turns out to have scale-free properties. And the implications of this are that a very small number, a small number of genes have a very large, disproportionately large number of connections. They're, they have high centrality, they're choke points, and they tend to be the disease genes. A large number of genes have a small number of connections, those are the leaves, and, the, and genes cluster. So that if you were to take this network and analyze the neighbor and analyze the neighborhoods you'd find a high degree of clustering around these highly connected, highly connected uh, nodes. And the cluster, for, for various reasons, the cluster sizes are also scale-free. You find uh, lots of small clusters and a few large clusters, and the size of those clusters are related to each other um, by, a, by a power law, by an exponential law. Okay. So now, so I'll stop here and just ask if you, if, have I confused you or bored you at this point? Yes, question here. What's the difference between uh, betweenness and connectivity? There, well, so, connect, uh, so um, connectivity is, uh, is, is a, a measure of, so there, there are two ways of measuring connectivity. You can just measure its degree, which is its immediate number of neighbors. Or you can measure the centrality, which is also known as the betweenedness, and that measures um, not just connection to your immediate neighbors, but your neighbor's connectedness to other genes. So two, so two nodes that have the same degree of four, um, if one of them is connected to genes or to nodes which have a, a higher degree, than the other one, then it'll end up with, with being, um, it'll end up having a higher centrality. Meaning that if one of those, one of the genes in its neighborhood wants to talk to another one, it will find that its shortest path will go through, the, go, go through that central gene more frequently than any of the other genes in the set. Okay? Yes? Each node to every other 
Yeah. The way that, so the way that betweenness is calculated is uh, choosing every pair of every pair of nodes in the network, computing the shortest path between them, and then recording the uh, rec uh, for each gene on that record uh, on that shortest shortest path. You you uh, record the fact that it was on one shortest path, and then you continue to do that, and then you tally at the end of that you tally up the number of times each gene was on the shortest path between two other genes. So some genes will never be on a shortest path. They're off in the periphery. Nobody cares about them. Other genes are sitting in the middle. They're highly connected to their neighbors, and their neighbors are highly connected to others. Okay? Okay. So now we get to network, network databases. So you can build network databases, um, network biological databases automatically, or via curation, uh, and there are a kind of very, this is a very popular thing to do. Um, there is a, uh, a Canadian-led uh, initiative called BioGrid that's collected 529,000 genes from the literature spanning 167,000 interactions. Obviously, these are not all, all human genes. These are uh, genes from human and many other species. Intact database. Uh, you look at the numbers are kind of interesting. 60,000 genes and 203,000 interactions, which meaning that um, they, uh, they are doing, a, they're looking deeply at each gene and collecting more interactions from the literature. Uh, BioGrid is looking more broadly because they have more genes and fewer interactions. Uh, Mint database, which is an old one, uh, has 31,000 genes and 83,000 interactions. Each of, this is, each of these network databases representing a different um, uh, you know, a different slice of biology. And, and fortunately, there are efforts such as the gene mania effort. Did you hear about gene mania this morning? Yes? No? Sort of? Maybe in passing? It's a, yeah, okay. Uh, gene mania is a, uh, a, a local effort from Gary uh, Bader and uh, Quade Morris's labs here to bring in all the interaction networks from around the world and put them into one uh, convenient spot. Yeah. So, uh, in addition to the curated sources, there are uncurated sources for interactions. Uh, one very popular approach is to uh, do text dumps out of uh, uh, scientific uh, literature databases such as PubMed, and then you measure, you, you calculate the frequency with which two genes are, are, measure, are co mentioned. And if they're co mentioned, they probably interact in such way, in some way. Uh, obviously, it's much faster than hand curation, and also, obviously, uh, it's not uh, it's not perfect. There are all sorts. This is a, a part of the um, uh, the problem of of, uh, of uh, language recognition. Uh, if there's the mention of hedgehog in a paper, are they talking about a gene or a, or the species? Um, you have to use con contextual clues to figure to uh, figure out what they're talking about. It is natural languaging processing, which is difficult. However, there are some pub very popular resources that have been built on top of them. One is IHOP, which is a great resource to play with. You enter a gene name, and it tells you every other gene that's been co-mentioned in the literature along with that gene, and then you can hop from one to another. And then there's a similar resource called PubGene, which I have not used all that much. Uh, and then there are completely, then there I hear some more uncurated interaction sources. Uh, there are experimental techniques uh, such as the yeast 2 hybrid protein interaction studies, where pairs of genes are put into yeast, uh, and if the two genes interact, um, they res they 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 um, rescue the uh, uh, the cells so that it can metabolize a an essential nutrient and it survives and you can work your way through the entire matrix of uh, all proteins in uh, over a matter of uh, months to months to years using this technique. Uh, I've already talked about mass spec um, analysis of protein complex pull downs. Then there are genetic screens. Synthetic lethal uh, and enhancer suppressor screens, in which you knock down one gene and then you look for epistasis by knocking down other genes to see if uh, 
the two, two knocking down the two genes um, contributes to a, a, a lethal lethal phenotype. None of these are perfect techniques. The in particular Y2H interactions take proteins out of their natural context and put them into a, the yeast cell. Uh, and even if they're physically interacting for real, uh, that's not the same as a biological interaction. Protein complex pulldowns are plagued by sticky proteins. For example, actin it turns out to interact with everything just because it's sticky. And genetic screens um, are sensitive to the genetic background, uh, ironically because of network effects. A synthetic lethal in one strain of yeast may not be a synthetic lethal in another strain because there are other things that you don't know about, which are, which are uh, also interacting and are not being uh, not being looked at in that study. They're not being controlled for in that study. So the way to so um, the way to uh, to work your way through the this very noisy data is to do integrative approaches. Maybe a single source of evidence such as a Y2H interaction is not sufficient to call a true interaction. But if you have other sources of information, such as um, uh, a mass spec pulldown, or co-mention in the literature, or co-expression in, um, um, in a uh, microarray study, uh, then those combining those three sources, uh, positive sources of evidence, points probably pretty strongly to the fact that these genes are in fact uh, uh, interacting. And so uh, one simple way, there are some simple examples of doing this. So for example, yeast to hybrid interactions are known to have a high false positive rate, as much as 40% false positives in the first screens that were, were published. Um, but if you do a simple uh, filtering of this to find to only keep those pairs which are expressed at the same time and in the same subcellular location, then you filter out many, many if not most of the false positives. A more complex example um, is to take multiple sources of curated and, and uncurated evidence and to use machine learning to call the true, to call the true positives. So here's an example. Uh, from uh, from Reactome, and uh, you will be you will be uh, using this in your laboratory. So um, version 35 of the Reactome functional uh, of of the Reactome database, which was actually about from uh, uh, about a year ago, um, contained 5,000 proteins um, and uh, 4,200 roughly reactions. Uh, well curated, high uh, high quality, but it only covers about 25% of your genome. And if you were to look at a cancer data set with this, 75% um, of your uh, mutated or overexpressed or hypermethylated genes would not even be in the database, which is you know less less than perfect. Uh, so we wanted to uh, expand Reactome's coverage. Um, to a, a larger number. So what we did is we started with curated pathways from Reactome. And then we extract, we, we, we used an algorithm to take the pathways and turn them into a series of bimolecular interactions while preserving their regulatory relationships, such as phosphorylation reactions or uh, inhibition or uh, activation reactions. Combine that with similar work, sim with, with Similar um, data extracted from NCI database, Panther database, and KEG, cell map, and TRED. And that gave us a, uh, a network of curated bimolecular in interactions from pathway databases. We then took a large number of um, networks from uncurated uh, high throughput experiments including protein-protein interactions from these two hybrid studies and pulldowns, uh, interactions in uh, other organisms, fly, worm, and yeast, text mining data, gene co-expression, domain interactions from PFAM, all of this being bits of evidence that two genes interact, but none of them being um, uh, definitive, and then used a machine learning technique called a naive Bayes classifier to, um, uh, to, to create a set of predicted functional interactions. So what we did is we, we took 
all these pieces of evidence. We then train that with curated information extracted from the databases, the pathway databases that we believe to be true. Um, and this derived a, a, a classifier system in which each piece of evidence gives a weight to the probability of that being a true interaction. And then when you apply it to unknown relationships, it gives you a prediction of true functional interactions. So this gave us a, a, a network of almost 11,000 proteins, about 9,500 genes. A gene can, of course, make multiple proteins through RNA isoforms, and 210,000 functional interactions. And so that increases the coverage from 25% to 50%, still not all the way there, but it's, it's, it's gotten a lot further. And by a series of measures that we did um, using um, uh, by, by curation and by comparing to other people's predictions, we, we pred predict a false positive rate of, of less than 1%. High false negative rate, however. We're still missing a lot of interactions. This is what it looks like. Uh, this is 5% five, of the network, sort of, sort of zoomed in here. And you can see this, the scale-free properties of the network. Um, there are a few genes which are uh, highly connected, and they form these very well-defined uh, clusters. And if you go in and, and start annotating them, you, you start to see things coming out like ribosome here and uh, DNA repair there. Lincoln, yes? Uh, and we're going to run out of time? No, absolutely not. So yeah. might not be that high, or it might be, this might be a fraction of a percent. Well, so it's a the false negative, the false negative rate is um, derived, uh, derived from being able to repredict curated interactions. Okay. So we withhold the curated information from it, ask it, uh, do these two interact? And 80% uh, of the time, it gets it, 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 it something that does interact we, that we know from the literature is not predicted by the by the classifier. That's an 80. That ends up being an 80% false negative rate. Yeah. Now, it only if we do the same if we do the same test with known interactions and ha and ask how often does it predict something that we know to be false because we have negative evidence. We know that they don't interact. Uh, it's it's less than one percent. Okay, so we tuned it that way because we wanted to make it. We wanted to enhance the coverage without contributing a lot of noise. It's an arbitrary thing. Okay. Yes. Um, so, just to be clear, so these are pooled interactors, right? Like it, mm -hmm. it's not necessarily context specific. Like That's specific. correct. Now we're going to get to the tissue specific, context specific part. So this network. It's a very good point, actually. This network is uh, all, of, all of human cell biology without any reference to the fact that some genes are only expressed in some cells and that uh, you know, they're, uh, they, they may be developmentally regulated and they may only be expressed in the early embryo and not in the adult. So this is a scaffold from which you have to now infer the network that's happening in your particular tissue type and context. And that's called active network extraction. And so what, what we now routinely do with cancer data sets and other, and other disease sets is after we have created the, the functional interaction network, which has been now been published and we've built tools on top of it, uh, you take the genes which are altered in your data set so somatic mutations in a cancer data set or genes which are hypermethylated or under, cop or, or under copy number alterations or which have changed expression patterns, extract from this, this overall network just the ones which um, you're interested in, the ones which are altered. And then, so that, that gives a subnetwork usually of, you know, a few hundred genes, a few hundred to a few thousand genes, um, which are uh, um, which are al altered in the disease of interest, and then we use community clustering algorithms to identify the genes in that set which are interacting with each other more frequently than we would expect by chance, and annotate them. And that gives us usually a series of disease modules that are measured in about uh, a dozen to two dozen. Okay. 
And this actually is a very simple technique. It runs very quickly. It actually, actually works quite well for taking a very complicated data set with a lot of annotations which you don't understand and turning it into a um, kind of a, a very simple overview of what's going on. So here, for example, is uh, a, a list of, of 900 genes that are uh, have somatic mutations in, uh, in breast cancer taken from the recent TCGA publication. We extracted those genes from the network, we clustered them, and, and then uh, automatically annotated those genes, and what comes up is um, signaling by tyrosine kinase receptors, focal adhesion, extracellular matrix, notch and wind signaling, um, uh, cell adhesion molecules, axon guidance, which is interesting, more and more uh, cancer genomes are, are coming out with mutations in these pathways, DNA repair. Okay, so, you know, you're looking at that, it kind of makes sense, and then you can zoom in on this and see the actual relationships among the genes um, that, are, that are involved and use pathway colorization in order to go back to the pathway database and um, you know, make, make, uh, build hypotheses about what those mutations mean. Here's the same thing for pancreatic cancer. Um, again, you get some modules which are the same, axon guidance, wind and coherence, uh, extracellular matrix, uh, focal adhesion, and then there are ones which are, uh, which are, which are different. And so, for example, um, uh, MHC class two comes up, and, and ERB, uh, EGFR, KRAS um, come up here, and that are not characteristic of breast cancer. What we find when we look at different cancers is that there are some modules which are the same, and other modules which are can which are cancer type specific. Now, this is, it, it, it is a little bit better than just making uh, pretty pictures. Uh, you can uh, start to d discover substructure in, the, uh, um, in uh, the patient population. So one of the, in, in the same pancreatic cancer project that we're working on, we're very interested in seeing whether there are subtypes of pancreatic cancer which are distinguished by different mutations. But if you just try to do this on the basis of genes, you don't get very good, you don't get good clustering of samples. So here we have a, um, uh, we're looking just at single nucleotide variations. Um, if there is no uh, mutation, it's blue. If there is a mutation, it's red. These are the patient samples going across. These are the genes going uh, uh, in columns. And we've attempted to do a hierarchical clustering and you basically don't see, there's basically no clustering of the patient samples at all. In fact, it looks like a mess, right? So kind of disappointing. However, if we go to this module map, and instead of clustering the individual genes, we just score each module on the basis of the number of times a patient had a mutation in one or more of the genes of that module, and do the same thing, you get this. Now here we're looking at the patient samples again uh, in rows, and then the modules, modules 1 through 12, um, are, the, uh, are the columns. And now we actually see a very strong stru substru population substructure. We have one group of patients here, another group here, another group here, another group here, and then a very interesting group up here, which is characterized by being K KRAS cluster negative. Uh, and so then the obvious next thing to do is to, to connect this to uh, uh, histological stage and cl uh, clinical characteristics to see if, there's some, if these, this makes a difference in the patient in patient outcome, which we're doing, but the... Oh, okay. I'm, I'm almost done, in fact. This is very good. All right. Um, and, okay. So I'll give you an example uh, in a little bit of, of, of doing that. Um, before I move on, um, in addition to the reaction on FI network, there are other uh, algorithms that do the uh, that do uh, do similar uh, similar things. So uh, uh, Hotnet, was, which was written by uh, Ben Raphael in his lab at Brown, um, can be used for expression or CS and B analysis. You run it using um, uh, a local installation of Python and MATLAB, and you visualize results in Cytoscape. Um, you'll see in your lab that uh, 
for the React MFI network, everything's done on the server side. Once you have Cytoscape installed, you can just run it within Cytoscape. And then there's an R package um, called uh, WGCNA used for expression analysis. And again, it uses network information to find clusters that relate genes which are, uh, which are, which are co-expressed. And to install it, you, you, uh, you install a package within the R statistical language. So I'm going to close with, use, with the discussion of using um, networks to discover uh, predictive and prognostic biomarkers. So the idea of a biomarker is that uh, you have a, patient, a population of patients with a disease and you can use a, uh, a test, either a molecular test or histology or uh, proteomics, to distinguish different classes of patients within, within that group that you would not see just looking at the clinical characteristics of the patient. And so, for example, if you have a disease in which uh, some people, the orange people, have, aggressive, uh, um, have an aggressive disease and progress quickly, uh, and others who have an indolent disease, who uh, you, you could just afford perhaps to watch and not give them aggressive chemotherapy with the accompanying morbidity, uh, you could test them to put them into, uh, classify them into two groups, and the high-risk groups you immediately treat with surgery and radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and the low-risk maybe you give them uh, a, a more conservative approach where they just get surgery and then you follow them. So the, the challenges in discovering this type of biomarker is, uh, the, uh, um, are, are threefold. One is overtraining. There are 22,000 genes. And uh, in cancer, you typically can see alterations in hundreds or thousands of genes. And the typical patient cohorts you have to work on are, are, are in the hundreds. So it's very easy to find a set of genes that nicely predicts survival in that one data set of 100 patients, that one cohort of 100 patients. But as soon as you apply it to an independent patient cohort, turns out that that biomarker doesn't work at all. And the field is littered, unfortunately, with papers on biomarkers that didn't replicate in independent studies. Uh, another problem is that uh, disease heterogeneity. We, tend, we, we like to think that there's only one kind of ductal carcinoma in uh, uh, ductal adenocarcinoma of the breast, but there are you know, at least four and probably more. And if there are many subtypes of disease and you need even larger cohorts than you think you need. And lastly, uh, there's a problem of tumor heterogeneity. You can have a single primary tumor that has subclones in it. And maybe one clone is the high-risk subclone and the other is the low-risk subclone. And we tend to analyze the tumors as one big, we mash up the big piece of tissue and we don't take into account the fact that it's got uh, it's got a subclonal structure. Right. I'm only going to talk about the overtraining problem. The networks can help with that problem. It can't help with the other things. So, what uh, the way that the way that the network analysis helps in uh, with overtraining is that instead of training a classifier on 22,000 genes, uh, you're training on 10 modules, and that reduces. The number of the, the, the number of ways that you can uh, you can find a, an association by chance. The work I'm going to talk about was done by Guan Ming Wu, a research associate in my lab, and published in Genome Biology last year. So this is a, a work that he did on uh, on breast cancer using uh, a, uh, a <coughs> microarray expression set from 2002, published in the New England Journal. So this was 295 patients, 12,000 genes were profiled by microarray, and they measured the, in addition to exp the expression profiling, they measured um, the, the, how long the patient survived from di initial diagnosis until death. And then he validated with a completely independent data set from 2006, roughly the same number of samples, roughly the same number of genes, and here it's, and in this case, they measured either recurrence or death. All right, so um, I'll show you the module map in a second, but um, the, the test was very simple. Guanming simply made the module map and then tested and, and got about uh, uh, 15 breast cancer modules. And then he tested each module for association with, uh, with survival. And he found uh, one module 
called uh, module number two, um, which is actually a very good predictor of survival in the estrogen receptor positive su subclass of patients. So ER positive patients usually are considered to have a very uh, have a, a relatively good prognosis. They have less um, uh, aggressive disease. They're responsive to tamoxifen and other rece rece estrogen receptor, receptor antagonists. Um, but it turns out there's a subpopulation of patients who have high expression of module 2, which do much more poorly um, in uh, uh, su survive for a much shorter length of time than those who have low expression of genes in module 2. And you've all, you have all seen Kaplan-Meier graphs at this point, right? Good. Great. Okay, and the p-value is good, 3 times 10 to the negative fifth. Um, in an independent data set, the independent data set, it replicates, and then we went on and we replicated it in a, in a bunch of other sets as well. So it's a good module. It's a good biomarker. Um, it's actually um, potentially clinically useful because you would like to know usually estrogen receptor positive patients receive less aggressive patient, less aggressive therapy. If you know that they're going to have more aggressive disease, then you might, you might uh, want to know this and, and uh, give them more aggressive treatment. Um, another, an advantage of the network, um, uh, the network analysis is that we can look at the relationships among these genes and, uh, and try to explain why that biomarker works. And in fact, when we look at what module 2 is, it is a, a module that involves um, uh, Aurora B kinase signaling and uh, kinetochore maintenance, both of them pointing towards uh, a role in, in mitosis. So this is a marker of proliferation, which, which stands to reason. So if the, G, if the cells are proliferating more quickly, it's more likely to be an aggressive disease, an, an aggressive uh, uh, disease. Okay. Um, last, so that's, so this is, this is where the reactant functional interaction network uh, stands. This is the, the lab example that you'll, you'll do. Um, the one problem with this analysis, type analysis, is it only allows you to look at one type of alteration at a time. So in these examples have looked at either um, uh, single nucleotide var variations, or, or we've looked at uh, 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 single nucleotide mutations in the pancreatic data set. In the breast cancer set, we looked at expression levels. Uh, you, can, you can look at uh, CNVs. You can look at methylation. But you can't look at more than one uh, alteration type simultaneously. Uh, another deficiency is that we have all these little directed edges in here. We know that KIF-20A is an activator of CDCA8 and an INSEN-P and Aurora kinase B, but we're not actually taking, uh, we're not actually using that information to take the expression data and predict overall effect on pathway activity. So the integrative techniques, which are really just coming online now, they're, being, they're an area of active uh, research, uh, um, promise to allow you to take various types of data, expression data, exome or genome sequencing data, copy numbers, uh, uh, microRNA and short uh, microRNA profiling, short hairpin RNA knockdown screens, et cetera, et cetera, and using the functional relationships within the network and the pathway, integrate them together to get out pathway activities which you can then mine for relationship to clinical characteristics. So the, um, uh, the technique that, uh, in my opinion, is showing most promise is from Josh Stewart's lab at um, uh, University of California, Santa Cruz. And it's a technique called paradigm. You feed paradigm two things. You feed it uh, a, uh, a, a directed network diagram. In this case, uh, uh, we're showing a little example from P53. And you feed it uh, multiple variation uh, data sets from several samples. And it builds a model of what the effect of those variations on each individual pathway is. And it gives you a, a, a map like this, where we have samples going up. I took this out of their paper, so it's using a different, uh, it's, it's rotated from what I showed you before. And then each row here 
is a path is a pathway. So it's showing that in some samples, this path, uh, these pathways are increased. Uh, other samples, th this pathway is decreased. Okay. And it comes also with, uh, so here is another article out of their paper showing how you can use this to cluster, uh, this is glioblastoma multiforme, into four different groups based on the integrated effects on pathways. And they've also developed a very nice circular visualization in which each spoke is a different patient and each uh, um, and each ring is a different type of molecular uh, alteration so that you can quick uh, and and then the pathway relationships among them are shown uh, you know are, are, are shown with with um, um, directed arrows and so it's a great way of getting a uh, you know, a sense of what's going on in the entire patient set. That's a, now the bad news about Paradigm is that you can only get it in source code form. Uh, it requires a bunch of third-party math and graphic libraries. They're open source, but it's very difficult to get to compile. I couldn't do it myself when I tried it. At Guanming was able to do it. Uh, the scant documentation on how to use it. They don't actually give you. You have to format the pathway data in a particular way. They don't actually give you uh, any pathway data. They don't have any examples of how to use it. Uh, and so it's basically, it's, it's used by that group and nobody else has used Paradigm. The good news is that because it is open source, um, the React Home team is working on a web service implementation of this thing that we hope to roll out within a, um, you know, later this year or maybe early next year um, it, uh, with the Cytoscape plugin to go along with it so that you can run the Paradigm analysis. And it will use React Home as its pathway database. So we finally reached the take home messages here. Um, I, I hope I've, I've shown you that pathway network analysis can take complicated gene sets and give you useful um, uh, um, and, and uh, reduce the complexity and give you useful, inf useful information on which you can make hypotheses and correlations to disease state. Uh, now the analysis differs greatly in complexity, power, and usability. The s most simple uh, types of analyses are these um, uh, diagram colorization systems. More moderate is the active network extraction analysis example that I showed you from Reactome. And the most complex are integrative programs such as Paradigm. And this work is, is very much a work in progress. I wish, wish there was more that uh, off the shelf that you could start using right now, but uh, over the next few years, I think that this is going to really start to dominate the field of cancer uh, gene analysis. And then I've left you uh, some earls to take away. Okay, thanks very much, and I.